Call the meeting to order. We need a motion to go into closed session for A1, A5, and A7. Somebody make that, please. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll make a motion based on Code of Virginia Section 2.2-3711 that we go into closed session for A1 personnel matters, A5 industrial business prospects, and A7 legal. Is that everything? That's all. I'm here. I'll second it, please. One each. Uh, I got a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor, raise right hand. Whoever needs to go first. I'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, first thing on our agenda is um, the invocation and the pledge. The invocation will be by Heather Street and the pledge by Ms. Kelly Woods. Mr. Chairman. Well, I'm sorry. I need a motion in about closed session, right? I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion based on Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3711. We went into closed session to discuss A1 personnel matters, A5 industrial business prospects, and A7 legal. Second. Got a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Okay, now we will have the invocation by Ms. Heather Street and the pledge by Ms. Kelly Wood. Need a motion for the adoption of the agenda as presented in the additional agenda. A motion on the floor is there a second? You got it. Any more discussion? And I'd just like to point out that under your closed session, your original agenda identifies uh, section A7. But the board actually went in for A1, A5, and A7. Rick notified that in his motion, I think. Is that? Yeah. Uh, any more discussion on the agenda? All those in favor, raise your right hand. I need a motion for the minutes of our last meeting. Mr. Sure. Chairman, I have a couple of questions about the, the minutes. Uh, and I apologize for not getting by earlier and talking about it. Uh, but the, <clears throat> a couple places in there, the questions were asked and they were answered. And the question is in the minutes, but the answer is not. I, I really think that the answer to the question should also be included in the minutes. Made by the board members or? Right, board members and just so, some of the discussion at least saying that there was some, uh, I'm looking at page 7 here, page 8, whichever one. Uh, Chill County District Supervisor Curtis Ray questioned there may be a conflict with the chairman that currently serves on the SWIFA board. Uh, with the, uh, and that was not answered. I mean, it was answered, but it's not in the minutes. And I just think that, you know, it should be in the minutes that the, it was presented that there was no conflict. Or, you know, I just think if you ask the question, it's important enough to have the answer in the minutes also. I agree. You know, the minutes are a legal document. And the IRS auditors and the courts recognize them as such. Um, and not to be critical of the minutes, but I'm just a little concerned that some, some areas are not given 
with what what discussion. We don't want a transcription, but I think that we need to have it. Valid points need to be recorded. So um, there's some areas that I've also noticed in the minutes that concern me. Certainly willing to hear whatever other areas you are. Well, I hate to take the board's time, but for example, we had a report from Conrad Hill, and he mentioned that there was six hundred to six hundred fifty thousand dollars left, and that there would be a committee formed to look at prioritizing some projects. So that was one area that I thought perhaps we could have listed that. Um, also, when we talked about the Asana Highway project, it doesn't give the discussion and the most noteworthy concern was that that came into being through a court order. And I know we had discussions saying that uh, it was there was a little bit of a problem with how it was disbanded. So I think maybe there should have been a little bit of input from that dialogue recorded in the minutes, rather than just you know, a statement that was discussed. Um, excuse me, but I've had the flu, so I'm just a little, a little sick. Um, when we approved moving some money around, and I see this, Michael, where you've gotten the certification from the auditors, um, my concern was that it was grant money. And so, and in the minutes, it doesn't really go into detail. I think this, I would like to see this become a part of the official minutes. It will be. If, if that's okay. That. I think that would be appropriate. Um, and I don't want to monopolize all this. Charlie, I don't know. There are some other areas also. Um, Just there's one typo thing on page eight. Well, it has two different page numbers at the bottom, but then under um, supervisor comment time, it, and this is a small thing, but it just says supervisor R. Curtis without giving a whole. Um, and then I think Mr. Atkins had asked for clarification about employees contacting board members. Um, for information, if there was, you know, policy on it, and I, I don't remember receiving an answer to that in the meeting. So it's just some things like that. The audio is recorded as well. But the, right. but the minute I mean, stands as the official right. document. Right. I'm just saying that, I, that there is another point of reference, I guess, as well. Yeah. And I'll, I knew that, Mr. Chairman, but um, it's just these minutes are legal documents. So um, those were just some of my concerns. All right. Sure. Um, um, are the posted recordings and audio of the meetings not a legal The minutes will stand where the minutes that will supersede the video. Is my understanding is that correct, Mr. Kimball? Well, actually, I think that the, the, the video and the audio is a part of the record that's compiled by this board as well. I think the written minutes rep are a fair representation of the issues that were addressed by the board. Uh, but there, certainly the recordings are still part of the, the, the entirety of the, of the documentation as well. So right. it, it does, it, it is included in that. But if something were to happen to that recording, I mean, they're just different you know, things to consider. I would understand. And, and, you know, the degree of specificity, we've addressed this issue once or twice before since I've been uh, here. Uh, the degree of specificity that is required by this board to be placed into the written minutes is a question a fact the board has to make a determination of in a majority fashion. If you want a, a verbatim transcript. No, I, of as I mentioned, I don't, I don't want it to be a transcription. Okay. Don't expect that. But I do want it to be an accurate representation of the important elements that we discussed because we are the elected representatives and we do have a liability for that. 
I understand, and, and I think the way going forward to address that is if board members have individual concerns with the degree of specificity with respect to what's contained in the written minutes, they should be prepared to come in and make a motion stating, you know, giving the page number and line number mm -hmm. that they have an issue with and, and proposing language to be included within those minutes. And that's briefly what I put. I mean, there, there are numerous ones, and I don't want to take a lot of the time here, but it's just that's just an example of some of the concerns. So. I, I understand. I do. Okay, I still need the motion for the approval of the minutes. Move to approve. Second. second. Uh, motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, financial status, Mr. Farr? Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'm probably going to be shorter today on the financial status of uh, a lot going on. I apologize. But I will go through. The, you should have a packet of information in front of you, beginning with a revenue summary. Um, as we go through that, uh, fund one, that's typically the fund that we always try to look at first. You go down to year to date column, you'll see that uh, <clears throat> within those categories, the county has received 21 million one twenty one six hundred ninety three year to date. You have a, a budget of 23, 391.875. You've got 227407 remaining, so you have collected uh, a little over 91% of your revenues, according to that, that front page. Uh, the next uh, one, two, three, four pages are the same type of summary for the numerous funds the county has. If you go to the bottom of page six, again, looking uh, at the year-to-date columns, you will see that through all the funds, we've collected 58, 875, 130, 71. That's out of a budget of 90,430,012. There's a balance of 31,554,881,29. So, you know, we're somewhere right around 65% of collections. If you go through these individual funds, you'll see a lot of that money is, is still remaining with the school system and, and some of our others that uh, tap into those basically later in the, in the fiscal year. You then go to the next report, it should say expenditure summary on the top of it. Again, the first page is general fund money. If you go down to year to date column, you'll see that thus far, uh, 12,777,835.40 out of a 24,121,145 fund one uh, budget number. Which means basically we have about 11,343,309.60 left or 47% remain. So that's a, that's a good indicator nearly eight months through the fiscal year that we have 47%. Again, if you look at pages two, three, four, and get to page five, again, those pages in between are summaries of those individual funds. You go to page five and you look once again down the year to date column, you'll see a total expenditure of 50,606,032.47 out of the 90,430,012 uh, amended budget. You have 39,823,979.53 remaining, which is 44%. So uh, eight months into the year, it, it looks fairly well for those two comparisons, revenues on expenditures. Your next page, and it's kind of small, and you got to kind of squint at it, but uh, it should be. I'm not sure what order. If you'll find the page that has uh, 10, 11, all the way across to 17, 18, that could be the next one. I think it may be out of order. But that's just a summary of past and previous budget years in comparison for deposits and expenses. Uh, if you Go all the way to the left, you'll see 10, 11 budget year. The difference, of course, is in deposits and expenditures. You'll see then we had a 
5,619,180,196. And if you fast forward over to 1718, there's numbers that are larger, that are smaller. These are all based on time periods, fluctuations. Uh, it's all time dependent. But currently we have an 8,872,891,57. And it's really interesting that we're, if you look at last year's number, we're $6,569.40 ahead of where we were last year, at least in receivables versus expenditures on that report. Uh, then if you'll go back, I think your county expenses and appropriations page, maybe we jump that one to get to the other one. But uh, this is a report that's generated by the treasurer's office uh, each, each month. What I do is I include... For this one, the February 28th of 2018, that's pages, uh, the first page, and then the second page titled Smith County Water and Sewer. And then I always give you a snapshot of where we were a year ago, which is the 2017 numbers. So I'd ask you if you could for just a minute take your 2018 sheet, have your 2017 sheet lay there, and I'll go down these columns with you. Uh, the first number. If you look at bank balance and CD investments, those numbers the Treasury Department uh, moves around depending on how they, they see and forecast, but we'll get to a total. On the 2018 sheet, you'll see a total of 13,817,227.62. If you look at the 17 sheet in comparison, it's 11,984,361.37. So on that number were a million eight thirty two eight sixty six and a quarter more. Go down to deposits in eighteen we had five million five eighty two five oh two and a quarter. In seventeen we had five million six twenty nine nine sixty five fifteen. So we're actually down forty seven thousand four sixty two ninety in deposits and expenses for twenty eighteen six million one sixteen five thirty seven seventy three. 17 was 5,726,038.75, so we're higher in our expenses this year by 390, 498,98. Subtract that off your, your top number, that brings you to a subtotal in 2018 of 13,283,192,14. In 17, 11,888,287,77. So the comparison of those two numbers provides us this year with an additional million three ninety four nine oh four thirty seven. Uh, carry that down to the unspent. The unspent are numbers that are essentially taken from the categories on the right, which includes social services, school operations, and general county. Um, the unspent appropriation in twenty eighteen is six eighty four one seventy four twenty eight. In seventeen it was nine thirty five nine twenty nine sixty eight. So we're $251,755.40 less in our unspent appropriation for this year. That brings you to a balance. In 2018, the balance is $12,599,017.86. In 2017, it was 10952358809 So that difference alone is 1646659 dollars ahead of where we were this time last year. So uh, with, with that in mind, your appropriation requests today are listed on your additional agenda. You have uh, available uh, the funding necessary to consider each of those uh, appropriations. If anybody has any questions at any point, uh, you're certainly welcome to, to ask the final two pages or two sections. You have a Treasurer's Accountability Report. The Treasurer's Office provides on a monthly basis. Uh, if there's any questions that relate to that, they would certainly be, uh, or you could certainly ask me or I can get in touch with them concerning any of the fund balances. And the last page you should have should be an AP listing. Basically, it says uh, it's by department. It's a, a March 18 payables, a March 17 payables, and the difference. And that tells you basically which departments uh, have, have spent less on this AP listing and which have spent more. So with that in mind, if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer those. If not, I'll find you out the answer. But you do have uh, everything you need to consider what you have before you today. Michael? 
<clears throat> I know when I came on the board, I asked for a detailed listing of the accounts payable for each month. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it's a lengthy document, and I really appreciate getting it. Um, I was wondering, though, because it's broken down by departments, would it be possible to get a report, because I know other accounting systems will produce this, that just gives the vendor and the total that was paid? Because I have to go through and kind of add up from each department. So if that'd be great, that'd be great. Next on our agenda is the uh, payment of the invoices, but we've run a little bit late, so I'm going to go ahead and open citizens' time. We'll come back and do the appropriations shortly after. I'll open citizens' time. The first person I have on the agenda or signed up to speak is Sarah Gillespie. Who would come and state your name and address for the record, please, for citizens' time? Sarah Gillespie. My address is 766 Cliffview Road, Saltville, Virginia. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the chamber today. I um, just wanted to give you guys an update on what's happened so far this year and what we're looking forward to. Um, a little highlight on um, our small business economic development. I'm sure you all remember that we received a $60,000 grant to use for our small business boot camp for downtown Chilhowee, and that is going really well. Um, we suspect that we'll see by the time the class is over um, all of the business storefronts that are currently in San Chilhowee be filled through that grant, so that's very exciting news. Um, we'll see six businesses open or expand through this first round. And after we'd already started it, we had so many people who called and were interested in it. And I only let people miss one class, so it was too late for a lot of those folks to join that we're um, starting another class immediately. So this Thursday, I'll start my second round of that boot camp. Um, and we already have 12 people signed up for that. So if even half of those businesses come to fruition, that'll be huge, because not all of those are for Chilhowee. A lot of those are for the, out in the county and other areas as well. So we're very excited about how those classes are going. Um, as part of our work in Chihuahua, we're also working to form a merchants group, which will help um, all the businesses cross-promote and network with each other. We're also working to have um, the downtown designated as a tourism area and a Main Street affiliate. That opens them up to a little bit more grant funding to add to the revitalization funds that they've received so far. So they, it's a prime time for them to leverage those funds for additional funds to continue their growth. Um, our next areas that we'll focus on in applying for grants to support our boot camp will be on agritourism and agriculture growth. And then following that, we'll focus on um, building on the work that downtown Saltville is working on right now to become an um, outdoor destination with the Virginia Tech designs that they've done to have campgrounds and things of that nature. So we'll, um, we'll gear our boot camp once that kind of starts to come to fruition to helping fill up their downtown as well. Um, and then we'll also continue to do things that we always do. Our monthly workshops have continued to grow. We've gone from hosting one every couple months to sometimes we're hosting two or three um, a month now. And I gave you guys just a little um, chamber calendar of events. These are just a few things that are coming up over the next little bit. So you can see. Any t we keep these on hand anytime you want to stop by and pick one up. Um, and we also, if you don't receive it, we do an email every Wednesday that goes out that has all of the activities in Smith County going on to try to keep everybody up to date of what's happening and all the things that there are to do. So if you're not on that email list, I encourage you to sign up. Um, we'll also continue to do our school farm tours, um, provide scholarships, do the business appreciation luncheon, our town and country barbecue, student government day, and our annual dinner, all the standard events that the chamber hosts every year. And we're also keeping our committees busy. Um, our agricultural committee is currently working on a legislative farm tour which I'm sure Jeff will be hearing about soon. <laughs> and we're working on um, an event similar to what they do on the fourth grade level with the extension office. Um, we'll do it on high school level to make students more aware of all the jobs that there are in agriculture. It's not always just that you're a farmer. Sometimes it's working with the extension office or even with farm credit, those sorts of things. Um, and so we'll be working on a program that helps high school students realize that and gives them an opportunity to decide to stay in Smith County. And then we're also working on a workshop series for local farmers. We're at a stage with a lot of our farmers where we're seeing the owners retire and a lot of the times their children are starting to take over. So 
we're offering some workshops for some um, requests that we've had to help that process transition a little smoother for farmers. Um, our um, Commercial Industrial Support Committee is working on ways to better involve our students, um, specifically in high school with our opportunity fair. So instead of just coming and walking around, they actually can receive sheets about all the jobs that are available within an industry, that it's not always just that you work on a line. Sometimes there are nurses within industry, HR, all those things. And that's something that until we're at this stage in our lives, a lot of people don't realize. So that's um, something we hope will help also our high school students realize there are jobs here and there are things that they can do. And then we're also working on the creation of internships and mentorships with our industries so that if we have children in trade school or that are interested in a specific field, we're um, working to help match them with shadowing opportunities they can have now. So they're making those connections and also finding ways to come back to Smith County easier. Um, our education committee is continuing to work on our imagination library program. Just want to give you guys a little update on that. And we began that program when we saw scale go away and there was no early um, childhood literacy program. We began imagination library for Smith County. Um, we're currently um, serving 501 children in Smith County. We've graduated 105 and we have mailed out um, 4,587 books to children. And those are um, children age zero to five and that um, there's no income requirement. The books are completely free to them. We do all the fundraising to purchase the books and mail those to the students so that they have them in their homes because we all know the statistics we've seen on how important it is to begin reading to your children early and how much that impacts them later on. And um, our Area Beautification Committee will also continue to do the programs that we've done with you all. Thank you to everyone who helped us find new people to be our representatives for the various areas throughout the county. Um, we're gearing up for that to start next month. So you'll be hearing from us about who the winners are. And then our Special Events and Tourism Committee has been very busy um, to do our part to support tourism for Smith County. Um, we're currently maintaining the social media sites for tourism and I'm manning all the listings for the Virginia's for Lover website. And um, again, this year we've organized that all Smith County um, events and jams will be listed in the Mountains of Music Regional Music Festival um, advertising materials. It goes out all over the world at this point. So it's a great way to get a little piece of Smith County that we don't have to pay for out there. Um, and then we've also met with Abingdon Tourism to work on sharing group tours. They've had a lot of success with bringing the group tours to the Barter Theater. So we're working with them to, when they have those tours planned, to bring them in to the museum in the Appalachia, to the Lincoln Theater, places like that. It's, you know, they've worked so hard to build up that program and with the Barter it makes it a little easier. So anyway, we can piggyback and get some of those tourism dollars too. We're working to do that. Um, and then we're also working on the creation of an agritourism trail. I know um, a few of you have been present at some meetings where we began work on that. It's um, I'm attending a conference next week where I have a meeting with some USDA folks, um, some Virginia tourism people, and we're working on some grants to plan out what that trail would look like and also um, funds for how we would train farmers who were interested in that value added product of having people come to the farm and become a destination. I think it could be big for our county. As we all know, agriculture is the biggest thing that we have. So the farms that are starting to see the loss and some of the things they might have been doing can hopefully find ways to boost. I know Todd and I have talked about this, find ways to boost what they have um, by providing wedding venues, group tours, different things like that um, to the county. And then we also are looking for unique ways to bring in tourists. We We'll host our second annual Hungry Mother Ultra. That's a 25 and a 50K. Um, last year we had 66 people participate. They came from Texas, Florida, out west, all over the place. I was really surprised. And so this year we're expecting over 100 participants. So that's a nice little boost to have 100 folks staying in and around Smith County. So we hope to see that grow um, and we'll continue to do that run. Um, any questions about any of the events or activities that we're hosting so far? Anything you all would like to see us do? Come up with workshop requests, anything that you all see a need for, please let us know. We're always looking for new ways to reach out. 
told me to call out during the ultra season. But I guess, I guess I'm out. That's, if you guys come run, you can enter for free. Maybe Chase would be right. Um, so we've submitted our funding request for the chamber uh, to the county offices. We did request a 50%, a 50 cent per capita increase this year. Um, that would bring our funding at, we currently get $1.50 per capita for a total of $33,573, um, which we've received level fund funding since 2006, and we appreciate that, um, to $2 per capita, which would bring us to a total of 44764 the reason for the increase um, is we have seen a loss of between thirty and $40,000 of our budget. We were currently participating in um, an Anthem Commission program, which was a program where if you were a member of the chamber or your business was a member of the chamber, you received discounts on your Anthem insurance, health insurance. Well, with health care reform, that program has gone away. So we no longer receive any funding from that. So over the past three years, it's been a $40,000 loss to our budget, which is huge. We've increased our dues, which our members have been glad to pay because we've increased our programs as well, but it's also hard to maintain our level of programming with our current funding, but we're trying hard and doing everything that we can to keep serving the county in every way that we can. So this is my fifth year here. I think we've probably quadrupled the programs since I got here, and I appreciate the opportunity to serve Smith County and work here. I always heard that you uh, never worked a day when you found something you loved, and this job has proved it most days. <laughs> Well, and do you, do you all have any other questions for me or anything I can do for you all? Uh, how well do you work with Ron and the Tourism Center? Do you all work together? We do. We do, yeah. Um, for example, on the group tours, um, Ron's not always there since he's a part-time employee, so he agreed to let the town of Abingdon um, be with work with the chamber as the point of contact for that since we're always staffed um, for those. So we work well with Ron and doing whatever we can to support what he's doing and things that he's not doing, we try to find a new way to branch out and do something a little different. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. We appreciate you. Mr. Scott Shoemaker. Which state's name and address for the record, please? Sir. Lawrence Scott Shoemaker, 618 Orchard Street, uh, Marion, Virginia. Uh, good afternoon, and, uh, gentlemen. Um, uh, I'm a co-owner with Hungry Mother Adventures, uh, the zip line operation out on Walker's Creek. And we have, uh, have secured a five-year lease at the old Hungry Mother grocery store. Uh, that is our outpost. I've rekindled and started the old white kitchen grill. So we are preparing food there. Uh, but my question here is, or my, my request for help, is on the zip line uh, and the other items that we're bringing in for attractions requires a third party inspection uh, into for amusement devices. Well, our zip line is not an amusement device, so it kind of falls into this gray area. We bring an inspector in that is certified um, to ACCT standards, and those standards meet and exceed the ASTM 5929 standards. So when we do the, the big inspection for our insurance company, we then have to take that report and give it to another third-party vendor to come and put the stickers on our zip line. And he just goes over that review. The building department typically does these inspections. Smith County is elected to take that away from the building department's purview. It costs us um, to bring Ken Martin in to put the stickers on about $1,500. Uh, we are still a startup company. Uh, we're going, in, going into our second season, and the financial burden is just, I think, um, is not acceptable, or considering the amount of work that has to go into it by reading the report that we provide him and have him drive from Richmond to get the stickers from the billing department to go put them on. Uh, I request that perhaps the board would consider or reconsider um, allowing our local inspector to inspect my operation uh, yearly. And um, that would save a lot of hassle and headache. Mr. Chairman, I have some information for that if you'd like to make yep. the rest. <coughs> Shoemaker, there's, a, there's some information that was provided to, to, to me that 
as it relates to carnival ride inspections. Which zip line does not fall under that category. You're aware of that. I was not. I was told that it was. Well, I was told that zip lines are separate from amusement ride inspections. Oh, great. That, that's, well, okay. But <clears throat> the information I was given was that basically Smith County was the only one around providing those services. So it led to us saying, well, everybody else is accustomed. There's, there's providers across the state. So be it. It came back up a couple of weeks ago, and I actually dove into it a lot deeper. And I sent surveys out to my neighboring county administrators. And it turns out that there, there are several around us that are offering what we call carnival ride inspections, contrary to what initially was believed to, to have been. When I collected all that, I actually had a meeting with the inspection department yesterday. We've reinstated carnival ride inspections based on the fact. I'm sorry, say that again? We have reinstated oh, okay. carnival ride inspections based on the, on the premise that you know, we were in the minority when it came to doing those inspections. Now, as I understand it, zip lines are a totally different thing. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not the inspector, so I can only tell you what I've heard. What I understand is the zip lines have to have the, you know, the cables inspected by someone, and, and exactly that's very lengthy. That's process. our big one. That, and from what I understand, that. even even though Smith County provides what we call carnival ride or amusement ride inspections, my understanding is that zip lines did not fall into that yesterday, today, or tomorrow. I, that's my understanding. Okay, so when we do the big. Uh, I call it a big, when we do the major inspection where the lines are all certified and they're mm -hmm. checked and they're measured, diameters, so on and so forth, right. um, am I to then submit that report to the building department and get the stickers? Well, the stickers, and again, this is my understanding, the stickers are supplied to the county regardless of who performs the inspection. Right. So then if, if third party somebody does the inspection, they have to get the stickers from our department to, to fly to those rides. So I'd be happy to further discuss it with you, uh, either now or, or whenever. But I can assure you that we have reinstituted what we call amusement ride inspections. But I do not think that zip lines fall within that category regardless. Okay, well, I was under the impression or I was told by several people in the profession that in the state of Virginia it was, um, which I can only go by what the knowledge that I have. And that's great, and I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, we are bringing in a mobile rock climbing wall and uh, for part of the adventure, and um, a uh, thing called a stunt jump. You go up a tower, and it's a very, it's a very uh, specific type of airbag, and you jump off, just like they do on, on TV, except this bag is um, state-of-the-art type of operation where it's zero, uh, nearly no one's ever been hurt jumping into the thing. And uh, so you're welcome to come take a leap of faith. I was, I just, I remember being that, um, just, a, and it, this may be not even paying out, but when White Top had the zip lines, it was my understanding that Josh Davidson was the inspector on that, and that he had the certification to do that. And he was at the time with the town of Chihuahua for the inspection. He's since left the town of Chihuahua, but is still in the area. Um, so it may be worth your while to reach out and see if. But I do remember the gentleman up there mentioning that Mr. Davidson from the town of Chihuahua is the one that, that he had reached out to and that had done his inspection. Okay. Unfortunately, there is no database that says this is what these people do, and it's in there, but you have to come through thousands and thousands of inspectors. Yeah, the DHCD website is supposed to have an accurate and current listing of individuals that have these certain certifications. Now, whether or not they do, I, I can't account for that, but I, I, am, I am certain. And Mr. Simpson was in the same meeting that I was in, and if I'm wrong, you certainly correct me. But the understanding was is that, irregardless, zip lines were a totally different uh, 
type of inspection than an amusement ride. Well, I'm glad I came and asked the question. And at a later date, we'll make an appointment that would fit your schedule. Sure. And we'll just sit down and chat. If you don't mind, come over and give me your phone number. I'll be glad to call you. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'll take care of that. Thank you. I have one statement or question to ask for you. When that was established, the zip line, I know there was a boundary fence supposed to be installed, and I've been getting a lot of questions about when and if that will be installed. We have not installed it. It's a separation. Yeah. There's a bunch of tree fall that's down that separates the two properties. But I can call Bobby, and we can go up there and figure that out. The concern of people going onto somebody else's property, really, it doesn't happen. We have a group that's controlled by guides, and they do not leave anywhere, do not leave my property at all. Right. Okay. So it's kind of, you know, it's one of those things. Do we really need a wall? Right. Or do we need a wall? So, Mr. Chairman, that was part of the deal when we gave you permission and rezoned it. I would advise you to get it done. Will do, sir. Okay. That was one of the landowner's requests that showed up here and asked that that be all. Okay. Unless I'm wrong, that was agreed to. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's all that signed up for citizen's time. Is there anybody else here that wished to speak at citizen's time? No one? I'll close citizen's time then. At five, we're running a little late today, so I'd like to introduce, privilege to introduce Mr. Stephen Clear, our superintendent at the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail Authority. And as all of us sitting up here know, we've had some escalating calls over the years. And Mr. Clear, I don't want to put you on the hot seat, but I guess you kind of are. The board would kind of like this to kind of get an update on what's going on and some thoughts maybe for our future. Yes, sir. Since we do have some new members, I do appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today. This is, I've been with the regional jail since 2003, since it originally started. So it has been a pretty good tenure for me. For people who don't know, if you look on the first page of the book that I handed out, the regional jail actually started as a committee in 1997. And from 1997 to 2001, there were a lot of meetings, there was a lot of discussion, there was a lot of back and forth between the counties and of what to do. And then they went to the state and the state approved building a regional jail. So in 2001, the authority was actually formed. By 2005, the authority had borrowed $100 million and built three new facilities, Hayside, Duffield, and Ed Abbey. Of those three facilities, I think it was 854 was the number of people they could hold. Over the years, they had filled up. And four years ago, 2012, well, I guess six years ago now, we decided to expand because of the time. So we went out and we borrowed $36 million and expanded. And now the capacity of the jails is about 1,500, 1,456. Today, you hold close to 1,900 inmates between our four facilities because Tazewell was at. But that's kind of where we stand. One of the things, if you look at page two, everything when the regional jail was set up was set up to protect the bondholders. We went out, like I said, and sold $100 million in bonds. And as a group of ten jurisdictions, at the time there was nine before TASL, when we looked at everybody's financial statements, there were some counties who were in better shape than others. So they wrote the documents to protect the bondholders. So everything we do, we have to go back through our bondholders. 
you have permission to do. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Can one, I ask thing, one, one question. Who are the bondholders? Uh, the last, we go through VRA, Virginia Resource Association was the last. One. And is that a group? I'm sorry, I'm new. So, mm -hmm. so can you explain a little bit about that? The bondholders? Okay, the bond, what they do, the, they as a state, they're a state agency, and they collect different debts across the state. Say that one county has a million dollars they want to sell. We might have five million, another county has 10 million. And then they sell a large group at once to get the better interest rate. So they consolidate a lot of people's uh, debt. I'm not sure, does Smith County have anything VRA? Uh, small. Yeah, so my, most counties are they're starting to go that way because it is a consolidation. So uh, now as far as who the bondholders are, they handle all that. Uh, you know, they, that's different groups by different shares. Can they be private? Are they yes. private individuals? Okay. And there's different regulations because we're tax exempt. There's um, there's just a long list of okay. the regulations concerning. Thank you. So, but until those bonds are paid off, they have a right to approve or disapprove what happens with our contracts. So everybody in our jurisdictions signed the contract. On page two and three, that is basically how we bill our jurisdictions. And if you notice on page two, Smith County, now this was actually done in 2000 and uh, actually year 2001. Notice that Smith County was 10.71% of the authority in 10, 2001. So I want you to remember that because I'm going to point something out here in a few minutes. It's kind of amazing that they're, they were that close. But what happens is, is every year they set a budget, or we set a budget through our authority, on what we feel like it's going to take from the localities. We start at zero. We have zero money at the beginning of the year, and at the end of the year we have zero. The authority gives any money back that it has. And anybody that owes money based on the number of inmates, that's how we build localities, and that's how it's uh, made up at the end. And uh, Section B on page 2 and Section 4 talks about those financing structures. If you look on page 4, real quick, this is over the last 10 years, basically. And this, from 2017 back, comes straight off the state compensation board. Every facility in the state of Virginia, sheriff run, regional jail, has to file financial reports from their audits, their financial audits. This is the actual cost that come. For 2016, for example, the regional jail had an operating cost per day of $53.20. We had an actual local cost of $23.05. If you look at all regional jails across the state, 66.87 was the operating cost. The local cost was $32.70. When you look at all jails, this is average across the state, $85.17 per day. The local cost, $46.16. Again, we're at $23.05, and that compares to the $32.70 and the $46.16. That's what we strive to do is try to stay year in and year out. We're in the bottom two or three of the local cost per inmate. That's what we try to work towards. And I think Mr. Carter will tell you every board meeting, costs are discussed. Uh, we have a, a strong bid department. Every product is bid out that we buy, and uh, every cost is looked at. One of the things that really drives Smith County's cost is the number of in there. And if you look at page 5, in physical year 2013, Smith County averaged 149 inmates. In 2017, Smith County was averaging 2004. Between 2016 and 2017, they had almost a 30 inmate per day jump. 
Now, since 2017, it's stayed pretty level. 2004, 2002, or two, 204, 202, 202. I will tell you that for the month of uh, January, the Smith County averaged 198 per day in our inmates. So when you look at the number of inmates, Smith County is leveling off the number that they have. But the big key is you have to compare it to what everybody else has. If you look at page 6, Budget for 2018, if you'll notice, we had 1,885 local inmates. 2019, we dropped on 100 inmates. Those 100 inmates were taken out of our system by the Department of Corrections. So they came and uh, people who were supposed to be in a DOC facility were taken into a DOC facility. If you'll notice, Smith County... In 2018, 202, 2019, 202. So again, Smith County's numbers are staying steady. The issue comes about in 2018 that 202 was divided by 1885. In 2019, that 202 was divided by 1775. So in 2018, Smith County share was 10.72 percent. In the next year. 2019, it jumps to 11.38%. So it's a st statistical issue with the total number of inmates. So when those others transferred to the other facility, it actually hurt? Yes, sir. They, they also took uh, 25 from Smith County. So 25 out of the 200, or 100, was Smith County. So it, it helps Smith County some, but it hurt when you look at the average with the other jurisdictions. So a decrease in, I'm sorry, Rick, a decrease in inmate population, not necessarily helps us, it's going to hurt us, is what you're saying. Yes, sir, because it changes the dis distribution percentage. Now, one of the things it's asked is, well, why didn't total costs go down? Total costs didn't go down because we're taking on federal inmates, earn more money, and we're taking on the city of Bristol inmates. City of Bristol inmates pay us a premium, or city of Bristol pays us a premium to hold Bristol inmates, and uh, the federal government pays us to hold federal inmates. Well, hardly seem fair for some counties. I mean, if your inmate population drops way down, you're still supporting them. Well, if your inmate population drops for the county, your bill drops. It just is as the proportion of the total. Yeah. So you stayed the same. Other inmate, other counties dropped, so their bill went down, but your bill went up. Mr. Chairman, when you say the inmates were transferred out to like federal facilities, DOC, Department of Corrections, state facilities. Okay, is that something that's done automatically based on you know time served or or conviction type or how is that done? Okay, uh, there's two lines of thought. First one is Code of Virginia says one year. The inmate is sentenced to one year. They become a DOC inmate and they'll be transferred to a DOC facility. About four or five years ago, in the state budget language, they changed that to two years or more. So you have to be sentenced to two years or more before you'll be considered to go to a state facility. Now, if you're in jail waiting trial for a year and you get three years sentence, one year is served already, so you only have two years left, you're probably not going to go to a state facility. And then they have to match up their beds with what is in our local facilities. Could that have been a reason for the possible increase in inmate population, the change in regulations? Oh, when that, yes, sir. When that first changed, you had a, over every locality had an increase in the number of uh, inmates. And that changed in 2011. 
Sure. And you may get to it, but, to, but to also the big difference is, is in the per diem for the DOC and the, what you recruit back from the state versus what the locality does. Yes, sir. In 2010, the General Assembly voted to reduce the amount of money they're paying localities for inmates held. Uh, for example, an inmate awaiting trial before 2000, physical year 2011, we would receive $8 for a day. Now you only receive four. There was a jail contract bed program. DOC inmates, we could receive $28 a day for a DOC inmate bed. Now you receive 12. So these programs that the state had, they reduced how much they were staying paying the localities to hold inmates. And uh, you're talking about millions of dollars. Essentially, they extended their time and lowered their pay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I had one my constituents call me. One of his family members, happened to be a female, picked up, was picked up by one of the deputies, a simple drug charge. And she was there six weeks before she got a bond here. <coughs> she could have been out the next day. What well, takes so long to get a hearing where they can get them out there instead of keeping them for two months before they do it? I have no. I didn't figure you would have the answer to that. No, sir. It, it just seems to me like they're hanging, hanging them around just to make money off of it. You know, because her, her lawyer took a vacation for three weeks and was coming and she was sitting in jail. <laughs> no, that's not a good, good thing. Uh, it's something to look at, you know, whoever's on the committee. Mr. Campbell might have better. <laughs> I mean, that's dealing with the courts. Uh, I will tell you that it, I'm amazed how quickly most people get out. So there might be some extenuating circumstances in that case. Because for the most part, we, we're holding very few now awaiting trial. Uh, it, we started out. We were holding a lot. 45% of our inmates were awaiting trial. You now have a pretrial program, which helps people get out of the facility while they're awaiting trial. And we've dropped to about 31%, 32%. So people get out pretty quick. So in that instance, there might have been an extenuating circumstance. Yeah. Well, I figured that too, but I checked several ages, several that way. Mm -hmm. That's why I get a lot of those calls. I'm sure. <laughs> I get a lot of the calls. But one of the things, if you look on page nine, uh, again for Smith County, the 1885 total inmates, 202 in 2018, 10.72%. In 2019, 11.38. That is just in the change uh, when, when you the final budget, we just received our uh, employee health insurance. The, the preliminary budget, we had an increase for employee health insurance. We have no increase, so we got some good news there. We've got some other good news from things, so the, the preliminary budget is going to go down uh, when we come to it. But even if you had a level funding of the regional jail, Smith County's bill would go up because your percentage of inmates went up. And we've had some uh, discussion how to change that, but I don't know how to be any fairer than you're paying for what inmates are in the facility. And you know, we, we've said if, there any, if there's anybody that comes up with a with a better plan, we're more than happy to to look at it. How do you calculate our average? Is it a rolling six month, a rolling three month? It's a straight twelve months. It starts on July 1st, runs to the end of June. So whatever our average is for this, say our 29. Yes. With the shift, I mean, we lost 25, we're down to 198. Is there a way to look at maybe deciding to do a more accurate rolling average to facilitate the 
One of the things, uh, we track that number monthly. And, and the budget, because the budget is sent once, you know, you could, we could come back and adjust the budget every quarter. But if you adjust it every quarter, that means you got to go back to every board of supervisors. They have to either reappropriate or take money back. And then you go to the next quarter and it does the same thing over again. But it's tracked on a monthly basis. Uh, up I don't know what the reconciliation is at the end of the year to. And at the end of the year, make up there is that reconciliation. Uh, if you look at the last page, well, I'll jump to it real quick and we'll go back. Over the last five years, since 2013, the regional jails gave $5.8 million back to the locality. So, but when you look at that, some localities have paid, some have got money back. Now, how, you know, how do we give money back? We give money back because we've held more federal inmates, we've held more uh, the OC or uh, yeah, the OC inmates, we've held more Bristol inmates, and any money that we get extra offsets the locality cost. So again, at the end of the year, we're back to zero. Any idea why the state cut back on our part of the DOC funding? Uh, to save money. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's just did your budget drop. Pass it down the line. Somebody pass, yeah, pass it down the line. Or just passing it. Down. Is somebody we can talk to, or if you can, uh, we talk to them every year. The, the the one thing about jails are not the pretty item in any budget. Uh, we're the second largest budget in every jurisdiction we're in. You have education, and you have jails. Uh, if you look to state, the state has education, and they have law enforcement. And, um, you know, when there is extra money, they already have ideas of where to place that extra money. Every year we go to the General Assembly and we say, you know, we'd like to see about doing this. And we talk to the Governor's Budget Committee before. Uh, it's just never placed in. It's not a priority for them. Uh, one of the things that helps this year the house side passed the Medicare. You would not believe how much we're hoping that that gets through. Because when that gets through, that allows our inmates to be covered. And any time you cover our inmates, that's less medical costs that you have to pay for. And you know, <laughs> we spend $6 million a year on medical care. That'll save, that'll save about $300 million statewide. To look out. If you go along with that, one of the actions that was taken at the last board meeting also has an impact on Yeah. The last board meeting the board voted, the, uh, they come about what they call pre existing condition. If someone enters our facility and, and, and say they have a pre existing condition, if they get sick and have to go to the hospital because of that pre existing condition, you don't have to pay for it anymore. Uh, we tried to do that when we first opened, but the small local hospitals, the problem is that in a rural area, they don't have enough um, write-offs, or they have too many write-offs. If you are from a city, they may not have enough write-offs, so they welcome the ability to write things off. They have to write off because they receive federal money. When you talk to the hospitals in our area, they already have enough write-offs, so they don't want any more. So they were always fighting when we asked them or said it was pre-existing. <coughs> but the board voted this last time, we're going to start using pre-existing even more. And you're talking about a million dollars a year is what that's probably going to save us. Not all coming to Smith County. But, <laughs> so, but you're also probably going to hear from hospitals. Because, you know, you, we're taking inmates there and not paying a bill. But if the person wasn't in our jail, they were on the street and they got picked up and had to go to the hospital, it wouldn't be paid either. So, but we're hoping the, the Senate will come to terms. We're not sure about the Senate on the Medicare or Medicaid. Mr. Chairman. Sure. 
in our last year's two years budget, Smith County's budget, overall budget, what is, I mean, roughly what's been the increase in the regional jail costs over that last year or two? Is it over a million? Counting the preliminary now? Yes. Somewhere in the eight hundred to a million dollar range. Based on the reconciliation. <coughs> I don't know what the answer is, but that increase is not sustainable. But yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I'd be I happy. I'd answers. be happy to back up and give you a history of how, about how we got to this point. I mean, it goes back a couple decades. If you remember, back in 1995, we had the abolition of parole in the state. You remember that? And then, so we started putting people in jail for longer periods of time. We started building new prisons all over the state. River North and Grayson County is an example of it. So the state began incurring greater and greater and greater incarceration costs. So some guy, some wise guy in Richmond decided, how are we, how are we going to transfer those costs somewhere else? <clears throat> so what they did was they t undertook a concerted effort to write regulations into the local jails that made it absolutely ineffective cost-wise to comply with, and they encouraged the development of regional jails. And the General Assembly was, at, was absolutely involved in this, and so they, they incentivized localities to enter into the regional jail concept that way. And now the bill's coming due, guys, because that's the reason for the change in, in the sentencing requirements. They, they went from one year to two years because that forces the localities to keep them there longer, it, the reality is it's about shifting cost, and it's been, it's been happening for two decades under that design I just told you about. I was never, no disrespect to, to you, Mr. Clear, in any way, shape, or form, but the reality is that when we entered into the regional concept, this inevitably was going to happen. And now the bills do. And we've got nowhere else to send it to. So here we are. When they closed the, the nine jails down, um, I give you this when we closed all nine jails, nine jails down and moved them into the three new jails, there was 348 inmates. That's all there was. And now we hit 2,000 on a regular basis. It costs money to enforce the law. The question is who's going to pay it, and the design now really puts the burden, uh, in, a, in my opinion, on an unfair basis on the localities. But that, that's still there. The other questions for me is, it's, it's, it's the issue, again, for, for us is the way the contract's written, we take the cost, how much uh, it costs to run the jail. We subtract how much money we get from the state. We subtract how much money we get from the feds. We, subtract, we have subtract any miscellaneous money we get. You know, you charge a dollar a day per inmate. The inmates pay a dollar a day. If they're in our facility, the ones that have money, uh, they buy commissary, they use the telephone. All of that money goes into the budget. It comes off the uh, local cost. That local cost is divided by the total number of inmates. And then each locality pays based on that number of inmates. What do you do? You gotta pay for it. You gotta have it. You know, this great idea of regional jails, whenever this come up, to me just don't seem like a great idea. But now they got us hung out the dry and we're gonna pay for it and no way to go. And who pays for it? The working guy. If you if you didn't have the regional jails Every locality would have to, would be having to build their own jail. Yeah, so sooner or later, it's yours. Yeah, but I mean, it just gets you just got a lot of things in Richmond where it's passed down. Yeah. I mean, they, they, listen, he knows this. He, he, the reality he is, they forced you. They forced yeah. you into this concept by writing those regulations so strictly, and, and I mean, it just wasn't cost effective to build and continue to operate your jail. Tazewell County built a brand new jail. He knows this. And before they ever moved into it, they were already outside of the regulations. Before they ever moved into it. And that's because they were continually writing them to encourage you, encourage localities to move to the regional concept, with the whole design being they were going to change the formula once you got into the, into the mix. 
and transfer those costs of incarceration off to the localities. And that's where we're at. Um, I never liked the concept. It, it's not anything. Believe me, they do a great job. Our regional, Mr. Clear and others down there, do a great job managing costs and managing, managing the jail under the strictures for which they're having to do so. But it's just, it's, it's unfair, unfairly put the burden on localities. And that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah, they, they had the localities, they enticed you with 50% to build the beds. And then once you had the beds built, they filled you up. But sad reality is, I mean, bills do, we got to pay it. The only thing we can do to curb it is you know, make sure they don't end up there. Yeah. That's holding school board to task. It's holding them. Every program that touches somebody before they turn the age of 18, that's holding them to task and making sure, that, in my mind, making sure the board that we're doing that and holding accountability and making sure they don't end up there. That's the only way to look, look at our number compared to Washington County. Look at our population compared to Washington County. And we shouldn't be a high, as high a percentage as we are with the number of residents today. Well, we're hoping, uh, you know, Smith County started the uh, drug court. I don't know if they've had a graduate yet. Maybe one. Four in it. Really. Four in it. So, you know, there are programs that those people would have been in the jail if they hadn't been part of this program. So there are some programs starting. So. Well, Sheriff Schuler and Mr. Carter and myself are the representatives on this for Smith County and, and uh, a little more abreast to what goes on down there. but. It's a it's a very very large number for the county to to handle and and I know as we get budget requests even last year we that was a number that hit us before anything else was we've got a seven hundred thousand dollar boom right off the get go so uh, I appreciate you coming Mr. Clear I just I, I wanted to give an opportunity for the board if they had questions and and maybe they'll have questions more later but um, I appreciate you coming up and talking you know. Just kind of filling them in a little bit about it, and and um, well, feel free to come by, look at the facility, look at some of the programs, and uh, you know, uh, we promise we'll let you out. Uh, we we'll get you in the back. <laughs> you do do a good job. I appreciate you. Thank y'all. Does anybody else have anything? Um, Mr. Floyd, do you mind if we take this five-minute break before we start into you, please? Okay. We'll take a five-minute recess. <laughs> I'll call the meeting back to order. Um, apologize for the delay. We have gotten a little far behind tonight on our agenda, but I don't know that we've done appropriations that late in the meeting yet, but we'll get to it tonight. Uh, tonight we got um, Aaron Floyd with Blue Ridge Discovery Center. You come up, please, and make a presentation. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Aaron Floyd. I'm executive director of Blue Ridge Discovery Center. I'm glad to have the opportunity to introduce our organization to your board, to Smith County. Um, this is kind of a, a, a quick marriage for us, I think. Um, we were formed in, in Grayson County, Virginia, on the other side of the mountain, um, doing education, research, interpretation work over there uh, for basically the past 10 years. And so um, I personally am from Mount Wilson, Virginia, um, and haven't really spent much time in Smith County, Marion, uh, Tana Rock, Damascus, that whole area over there. So getting to know this region is really important for us. Um, we're, we're making a big transition in our organization um, with a new physical center uh, located in Smith County. And so this um, opportunity to, to share with you our program, our vision for our future center um, is essential not only for your support here tonight for a grant, um, but in terms of long-term support of our programmatic uh, services in the county. So uh, definitely appreciate your, your ears and, and would love to have chance to answer any questions at the end if you uh, have any other, other questions for me. Um, like I said, we were formed 10 years ago. Our mission is to inspire curiosity, discovery, and stewardship 
through the wonders of the Blue Ridge. Um, so we've been operating over there in Grayson County, Carroll County, Gilax, past 10 years in school systems um, with a, a general community and uh, with some partnerships with research groups. Um, and just this past November, we were given uh, the old Connor Rock Girls School, which is located right at uh, the intersection of Route 600 and 603 uh, by the Connor Rock Retreat House, who you may be familiar with, um, nonprofit organization. Um, and they uh, basically ran into a, a, a dead end with their funding opportunities to save that historic structure. Um, and we were connected with that organization a couple years ago and began negotiations and finally resolved this November for them to deed over the property to us and turn it into our future center. Um, and so since November, we've been making that transition. Um, one of the first things we did was apply for the Appalachian Regional Commission grant, um, and we were successful with that, a $500,000 grant uh, as, as part of the renovation funds for that project. Um, but secondly, we decided we'd follow up right off the bat with uh, the Industrial Revitalization Fund grant. Um, and that was applied for just at the uh, beginning of this month, a $600,000 application. And we were looking for your support on that because that grant requires um, a county as the fiscal agent for that particular grant. Um, and so I have here uh, tonight Brian Reed, which um, you guys are probably all familiar with, but who couldn't make it is Gavin uh, Blevins, who uh, pretty much pinned the, uh, the grant for us. But I think that Brian could possibly answer any questions particular to that grant that you might have. Um, so th those are two key funding pieces, but we're going to be searching out about $4.5 million to uh, fully fund this campaign to, to build this facility into our future center. Um, part of that's coming from the grants. Part of that's coming from uh, tax credits, historic tax credits. It's a building on the uh, National Historic Registry. Um, but it's also coming from private donors. We have recently got a $250,000 contribution towards that, but we're kicking up a capital campaign there. Um, part of it's going to come from partnerships with universities, consortium of universities for research in that uh, facility. Uh, but I'd also like to eventually su seek support from the county in some fashion or another. Maybe it's not through the capital campaign construction of this project. But maybe it's down the road um, in terms of operations. One of the things that we want to do with this facility, and the primary thing that we want to do with this facility, if you see the brochure that I gave you here, um, three main functions, the, the education, interpretation, and research. Education is going to be our primary focus with this building. Um, we're going to be serving uh, the region at a, at a five to six hour radius, uh, but our core service area is going to be Smith. Grayson and Washington counties. And so we're going to be bringing in school groups for multiple day programs, a residential education facility where they're able to um, spend time at this facility uh, three, five, seven days at a time and do programs throughout the Mount Rogers region focusing on science, natural history, um, and trying to, to educate these youth about the place that they live. Um, place that they uh, hopefully will come back and, and appreciate one day. Um, and so a lot of our programming uh, is aimed to really connect our community to the, the natural assets of Mount Rogers. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Mount Rogers recreation area, um, but I, I just want to point out that it, it was formed um, in, with a lot of promises in its original day. Uh, in, the, in the early 60s, mid 60s, 1966, I believe. Um, a lot of economic promises. I, I know the original plans called for things like ski resorts and uh, scenic byways and a big lake and whatnot up on top of that mountain. 200,000 acres of land that was, um, some of it was purchased, some of it was condemned, um, but it was done with the promise of major economic development in our region. And a lot of those plans, in fact, most of those plans didn't ever come to fruition. Um, for better or worse, I think all of us can be thankful there's not a ski resort up there. But um, that being said, there, there's still a lot of promise left on the table with that 
Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. And we feel like that Blue Ridge Discovery Center can be a gateway to that region, um, can turn it basically from the end of the road into a, a focal point, um, not just locally, but on a, on a regional and national scale. So you'll see if, if you uh, reference the brochure, and I've, I've given a few of you a business plan, um, how we feel like this, this program and, and our focus on that area can bring uh, quite a bit of economic development to some, some suffering communities there in Conner Rock and Troutdale and White Top, um, but also to serve our, our uh, public education system uh, quite significantly. So if you like to pick my brain a little bit, I'd love to answer any questions you might have about the organization. If we can talk about the resolution at all. Um, and, and I know that you guys kind of met informally um, and, and were briefed on it slightly. But, uh, uh, the only resolution is actually under the committee recommendation that will come up here very shortly. Okay. But uh, they, they have a copy of that resolution. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I have a one just sure. yeah. uh, with the proximity of where you're at there and uh, you know, we're we're looking at Virginia County, Virginia sources. Have you given any thought, you know, because you're gonna be working with kids out of North Carolina too. Sure. Have you approached anything in North Carolina as far as support? Um, you know, when we originally decided to move over this way, we had a choice to, to locate our, our organization on the eastern edge of the Blue Ridge Mountains or on the western edge of the Blue Ridge Mountains. We could locate over there at the, at the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway. They were really pitching us to move our facility that direction. But we felt like Mount Rogers was a much stronger ecological significant location for us. And we decided to move over this way and take advantage of the item and corridor. We have somewhat left behind the constituency of Winston-Salem and Greensboro and Raleigh. Although those two, those people do come up to this region, um, we're really focused more on the item one corridor at this point in time. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, Mr. Well, we appreciate the, yep. the update and the and the information. So, sure. Sure. before Aaron sits down, can sure can we cover and maybe Brian also can we cover the steps that. We've accomplished thus far, and, and as I understand the resolution, is the remaining piece, but just, just so that the board understands what steps we've taken thus far in the process. So I can speak to that a little bit, Brian. You might have some. Um, we've um, submitted the, the, the application um, one second, um, and we're going to send a, an amendment to that. If you guys support this resolution, um, and, and basically uh, agreeing to become a physical agent of the, of the grant. Um, there's basically no obligation except for check writing in this process. Um, there is an auditing process that will take place uh, for the grant, um, but that's covered in the grant <coughs> itself, so we've allocated funds within that grant to, to pay for that auditing process. In addition to that, I've also spoken with the treasurer's office, also made them aware of the possibility of basically acquiring another checkbook and being responsible for that as well. If we get this grant, it means a tremendous amount for us. You know, $600,000 is a lot of money for this project. It would put us really close to being able to, to have uh, funds to pull the trigger on construction out there on that 17,000 square foot facility. It'd mean a tremendous amount. When, when would that be awarded, or when would that be, you would know about that? We would probably, the county would actually receive the award announcement probably four to six months. That's, it has to go through the state review process. And the reason that uh, the Blue Ridge Discovery Center comes to the county is because where the Appalachian Regional Commission was a federal program, and allows nonprofit organizations to request the funds directly. The state program does not. So the state funds have to be awarded to a local government, either a town, a city, or a county. So since this project is located in Smith County, Smith County is essentially the applicant and would be the grantee uh, and have a 
partnership agreement with the Blue Ridge Discovery Center to then provide those, those funds specifically for this project. It should be no cost to the county whatsoever. The uh, Department of Housing and Community Development will require that this project be part of the county's annual audit. So we wrote into the budget, I think, $3,000 to help offset those costs. But the, but the additional, but the funding, should it be successful, the county being the fiscal agent, we would have to have line items within our budget to be able to write those checks out. Right, and, and, and that's another thing that we, did. we simplified in the application is we tried to keep the majority of the funds just for construction so that you should only have maybe two additional line items in your county budget. And again, it's going to be set amount coming in and that amount going out. We um, use the county cam system, correct, to, to, to submit. Correct. And, and yeah, we, I'm just talking about for planning purposes <coughs> for the upcoming year is, is budget committee and board, if, if you see fit, will have to accommodate that both on expense and revenue to accommodate going along with the award. Construction should uh, potentially start this coming fall or right at the beginning of 2019. If we're lucky. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to, I know that's an appointment committee, but I hate just keep putting off these appropriations. They just kind of bother me. I'd like to go back and get those taken care of if we could, and then we'll go into the committee recommendations. Um, under general county appropriations, account payable listing, uh, $1,129,130.12. Payroll, $660. Nine thousand four hundred ninety-three twenty. Auto draft and rural development eight thousand nine hundred seventy-four dollars. AEP CenturyLink bills twenty-five thousand. County administration fund five thousand. For a total county appropriations plus carryover of one million seven hundred eighty thousand. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor. Uh, social services, March 14th through March the 31st of 2018, $340,000. April 1st through April the 10th of 2018, $60,000. For total social services of $400,000. <clears throat> Motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Uh, school operating fund. Instruction, three million dollars. Administration, is attendance and health, one hundred twenty-five thousand. Transportation, two hundred sixty thousand. Facilities, three hundred seventy-five thousand. Food services, two hundred and thirty thousand. Technology, one hundred thousand. For total school operating fund of four million ninety thousand dollars. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor. Um, share fund seven forty eight, one thousand one hundred twenty dollars and sixty cents. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Uh, EDA fund four, three thousand one hundred ninety four dollars and sixty cents. Motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Add Wolf Sewer Projects, $82,534.63. So moved. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Courthouse Project, $420.59. So moved. Second. Motion two seconds. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Won't be the latest in the meeting. We've had that, got that done. Um,
appointment committee. It's page 20 in your agenda. We had an appointment committee um, February 22nd. Um, Mr. Ray made a motion to appoint Heather Williams as a member at large representative to the SWIFA for a four year term beginning March 1st, 2018 and ending February 28th of 2022. That's a committee recommendation. All those in favor? I'd like to make a comment for me, but Sure. Um, I've asked around and I, I now know who Heather is and I have no problem with that, but I feel we on the boards have been notified that there was a vacancy and give us all a chance to look in the community and see if we had anyone we thought would make a good SWIFA member. Uh, after asking around, I feel comfortable with, with Mrs. Williams, but uh, I just think we need to be transparent with these things and get the word out there to, that we have an opening and uh, so we can ha make sure we have a good person, which in this case I think we do, but we're just going about it wrong. That's all I have to say. Any recommendation? All those in favor? Uh, the committee also discussed uh, Smith County Library Board appointments and options for having equal representation by all districts. Uh, discussion was continued on this item uh, with uh, Supervisor Curtis Ray making a motion to recommend discussing this option with the full board at our next meeting, and that's where we are today. Uh, I guess that was, uh, I guess that's a committee recommendation with a motion made, so we'll need to vote on that as well, correct? Or just that we discuss it? I think the goal was to bring it up. Mr. Ray, you, Mr. Ray, you certainly clear. I think the goal was to bring it to the board's attention that that discussion is, is occurring. Okay. Right. And, and to it's, see it's, if there's any additional commentary or whatever. I think, I think with the current structure and the current terms that exist, it, it, it's not a simple open and shut. Yes, we're going to go to seven, no, we're not. Because the people that are there now have terms. And those terms, there's there's a couple of people that, there's one district that has two people representing it and two districts that have nobody representing them if we were going to go to equal representation. And I think the my my intent was to just at least have some open discussion about you know how do we how do we get to that point if if the board so moves that we that we go to equal representation for you know, the seven districts that are within the county because uh, it's not a with, with the five members that are there now and their 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 terms it's it's not a it's not something we can just move and go to from day one so I think it needs to be a general consensus of how we're going to get there, if that's the decision we make to get there. And I guess with uh, Jen in the appointment committee, or <coughs> I guess that's the committee that would take it back up, or maybe personally, I don't know exactly what committee would address that, but I think there's several options that, that need to be discussed, and I guess that's why they brought up for everybody to talk about for the lack of transparency, so to speak, for you guys, that, that, it's, uh, that we talk about it in... Um, <coughs> Because it's got to work. It's got to work for everybody to do, and to get it to work, just, just like Mr. A said, there's several things got to be considered. I mean, there's term issues got to be looked at. Um, I mean, it's not something that's going to happen tonight, but I guess it's just kind of getting the consensus of the board as where you want to move. If you want to move in this direction, and, and um, we either talk about it as board as a whole board, I guess. Uh, the committee for recommendation. Well, but then I don't, you know, the transparency word, I, I just soon have everybody involved, and then that way everybody knows what you're talking about. So uh, we can either do that tonight or just know that that's on the table, and we'll we'll talk about it. Everybody get your thoughts together, and we'll talk about it later today. Get you got some thoughts together for what about the having two from one district and, and term limits and uh, that kind of thing. I don't, I don't feel like right now is the 
is poised for the perfect time to maybe have that done. There's there's some things still going on that, that need to get rectified, I feel like, with the library system that we move in this direction. So uh, I'll leave it up to whatever the board wants to do. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. I for one, I'm not a, I mean, I'm not opposed to having that conversation. Obviously, I, I believe when, when litigation is finally resolved, uh, that would be a, a much better point uh, to have that discussion. Uh, but like I said, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. I just mm -hmm. think it's probably a little early at this point until we close out some other issues that are lingering. Mr. Blevins, I'm opposed to it, but you know, there's a lot of things going on right there. Uh, let it smooth out a little bit. Talk about it at a later date, see so where everything's headed. Right now it's running. As far as I know, everything's going okay at the library. I mean, it's, it is. it's not shut. So I think uh, let's, let's give it a little while to think about it. I'd like to think about it. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I really can't say a lot about it. Uh, I contacted the Ethics Council, and so according to Virginia Code 2.2-3101, uh, and since I work there, but I would just like to say I've had a lot of comment from the community about it. I do know last year when the system was dissolved, the State Library was told there would not be a Board of Supervisor on that board. So with Mr. all respect Chairman. to Mr. Blavins. Yes, sir. Uh, again, for about the 20th time, uh, the email that Ms. Warren is referring to uh, that went to Ms. Armantrout at the State of, of Library of Virginia, uh, at the time that it was being re dissolved, uh, that was the intent, I believe, I don't want to speak for anyone else, uh, but that was the intent of this board. Because at that point, there still was a intent, I guess, for there to be a Smith Bland, and you, you, you tell me if I'm misspeaking, a Smith Bland Regional Library board, mm -hmm. uh, and then two months later, things had changed substantially, mm -hmm. uh, and then that's when there was a an appointment of five, mm -hmm. and that decision was made. So to keep referring to something out of context of date, with all respect, is Mr. Blevins, difficult. We to can take. pull that email. I don't want to get into the discussion tonight, but you you did say as of July one, and she based. I a lot of decision on it. Again, but as of July 1. Let's not 1, get into that. As of July 1, that was the intent. Yeah. That you were well, dissolving the system. Two months well. later, there wasn't a Smith Land Regional Library. That you were in the process Obviously, of dissolving it. We didn't know where that was going to go. Right, well, right now, we're just, well, just for the record, there are people who are concerned about it, and I do think they deserve a voice. As I said, I will abstain from voting on it because of this section of the ethics uh, code of Virginia. Well, we're we're not having a vote tonight. We're just we're just kind of, I guess this is just for information purposes as much as anything for you guys to think about and talk about. Uh, if you got some ideas, we can we'll definitely address it. I've been asked a bunch about it in public, and I know you guys have too. So if it's something we want to do as a board, then then we need to get our heads together. But it can't just yeah, I vote to put a member on and there be seven members. So. Uh, we just got to figure out how to, and and I, I, I agree with Mr. Blevins. I think there's the time needs to be right to do that, and I think when things are kind of where they need to be, then that's how we'll address it. So um, I don't think anybody, or I've not heard from anybody that opposes the idea of having seven members, one from each district, on the on as a library board. I haven't gotten that from any of you guys, so um, we just need to. <coughs> Think about it to get that process to happen. So, Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question of, of legal counsel? Sure. Uh, if that is the direction that we think we we might be heading into, uh, would it be appropriate to get an advisory opinion? Uh, I know when I was elected to the chairman or, or elected to be on the board and work for the school system, I had to request an advisory opinion that basically said uh, because I was an employee of Smith County Schools. Uh, and in my candidacy and election to supervisor, uh, getting that clarification on what my role could or could not be. Uh, if that's something that we're eventually going to be, you know, considering heading into, 
obviously, since we do have a board member who is an employee of the library, to be proactive instead of reactive, would it not be appropriate to get that advisory opinion or at least the process started? I mean, I think it sounds like she's already inquired to some degree about that. So I'd like to get a response from Ms. Stefanski, um, and I cited that code, Mr. Campbell. Yeah. Basically, no member of this board can have a conflict with even in their families can either. So, I mean, you can read that. Uh, no, uh, I, can, I'm fully aware of it. And, I, and if, if the board wishes or Ms. Wyatt wishes to have a formal opinion, we can ask you know, our local common attorney to provide that also if need be. I would like to request that because, you know, it's for me when I got one, the, the concern was I work for the school system. Of course, Mr. Toad is my the, my school board representative elected from my area, but obviously I didn't appoint Mr. Choate to represent my area. Uh, this situation would be a little different of, of the potential of appointing someone to a board that would then oversee me. Uh, so I, 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 for one, think we probably should at least get get the advisory letter so that well, the everyone's on says, the same page. Let me just start, because this is the response from the Ethics Council. Uh, because I did ask because I didn't want to be in violation. Uh, it says, a personal interest of an officer or employee in any matter considered by his agency, um, it prohibits such personal interest exists when an officer or employee or a member of his immediate family has a personal interest in property or business or governmental agency or represents or provides services to any individual or business in such property, um, business or, or, okay, I'm sorry, in such property, business or represented or served individual or business is the subject of the transaction or may realize a reasonably foreseeable direct or indirect benefit or detriment as a result of the action of the agency considering the transaction. A personal interest is defined in the same section as a financial benefit or liability occurring to an officer or employee or to a member of his immediate family. And then it goes on to talk about there are six different ways that personal interest can be triggered. Um, and it says that you can't have an interest that's $5,000 or more annually, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So I was just looking for my own, you know, what my own parameters were with this. Um, so I, I had asked a follow-up right. question with some of the others. Well, but the advisor, I mean, the advisor opinion is just getting, you've read the code, and, and I mean, I've read the code when I had to do mine. Uh, but the advisory opinion is just the interpretation from the Commonwealth attorney on how that fits with the current position. That, that would, in my consideration, be what I'm talking about. Getting things together before we, we're not going to dis make that decision tonight, but if those are things that affect decisions and how we're going to proceed, then I'm just saying those are things we need to gather up if that's the direction we're headed in. And nobody said that's the direction we don't want to head in, so. Well, that we are. It's just that's, that's the one answer that we would need to have. Right. So, so, um, so we'll, we'll gather that information, and, and I, I, if you need to talk with Mr. Campbell for legal counsel on questions or, or, or whatnot, then I recommend that's how we proceed. But is it not Mr. Evans's duty to do that if we request it? We, can, I, I believe that's the case. We can ask and, him. And I kind of, you know, uh, just to cover all bases. Uh, I only see one attorney sitting at this table, so I think it's a good thing to let him do this. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I think you have a motion. Did you make a motion, Mr. Blank? I've made a motion that we we proceed to get that so that we have that in our one of the discussion. If the discussion comes up, uh, we know what the parameters are. Because that would have an effect on from the you, structure. Right. I've got a motion and a second to start that process. Uh, is there any more discussion on that? All those in favor? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, budget committee uh, recommendations on page 21 and 25 of the of your uh, 
booklet. Uh, we met on February. We meet all the time. It seems like but we met February 22nd. Um, Mr. Carter presented the budget amendment request for the sheriff's office um, on 7:39. Um, would you like to cover that one, Mr. Simpson, or or Michael, either one? I'll, I'll be happy. If you to. would, uh, the sheriff's office actually received some additional money. Uh, through donations and such into their DARE fund. Uh, this additional $5,000 amendment allows for the receiving of that donation as well as the ability to expand it out. So inside that fund at the end of February was a total of $51,867. So they have the ability there within. This is simply a process to accommodate the receipt and the ability to receive. Uh, it is a committee recommendation. Uh, is there any more discussion on that one? All those in favor? Okay, uh, we also, uh, Mr. Carter presented us with a uh, request by Mr. Floyd, uh, Executive Director of the Blue Ridge uh, Discovery Center to submit a grant application um, uh, for up to $600,000 and for us to be the fiscal agent. Um, and we, and, um, and the information for us, a resolution of support by the county. So um, we continued the discussion. Um, the deadline for the grant application was March 1st. Uh, Chihuahua how supervisor Mr. Ray made a motion to uh, move forward with the project and to allow staff to provide the needed do what is needed to meet the deadline and, and that was a committee recommendation as well so um, I guess that will go along with passing the resolution Mr. Chairman the remaining piece of the puzzle is the resolution to compliance is for the board to consider the resolution on page 23 of your agenda. Would you read that for the record, please, and then we'll vote on that. The resolution in support of the grant application for DHCD IRF funds for the Blue Ridge Discovery Center. Whereas the County of Smith has previously participated in the Department of Housing and Community Development programs to apply for funds to complete projects throughout the county, Whereas the County of Smith has determined there is a need for economic development, job creation, and enhanced youth education resources. And whereas the County of Smith is acting according to the desires of county residents in supporting the renovation of the historic Conorock Girls Training School. And whereas the Department of Housing and Community Development has made available industrial redevelopment fund grants of up to $600,000 for the revitalization and reuse of vacant properties that will provide a measurable economic benefit to their local community and the region. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the County of Smith hereby agrees to submit a grant application for up to $600,000 in DHCD IRF funds to be used with ARC and other funding to renovate, revitalize, and reopen the historic Conorock Girls Training School building as the Blue Ridge Discovery Center a major economic attraction and residential education facility for our communities within the county and the region. So that is the that is the resolution. Uh, I, I guess I would need a motion that came from committee. It was not a committee recommendation, so we'd need a we'd need a motion on the floor to pass the resolution. I'll make a motion, Mr. Chairman, to adopt the resolution as presented. Motion. Motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Um, Mr. Chairman, may I just, Brian, Darren, I will get you to sign the information shortly. Have it on the send it to you. Ten four. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Uh, Mr. Simpson, um, you informed the committee about the rising cost to uh, 
and inconsistent service, the long distance provider for the Sheriff's Department has been changed to TailScan from TailScan to CenturyLink. Uh, that's this informational. Mr. Simpson then talked to the committee about the postage machine. The, um, the lease had been renewed for another three years with no charge, no change in cost. Mr. Corner, these are just informationals. I mean, I, I can read them if I need to. Uh, Mr. Carter presented information to the committee regarding the tree removal project of the Wyth Airport, uh, the pre projected cost that may be associated. He presented information to the committee concerning the 1819 budget for the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail. Uh, and then we adjourned. Chairman, sure, well, I can provide a couple. Yes, sir. To that. Uh, fortunately, we had Stephen Clear here tonight to kind of update the board on the regional jail portion. The airport commission, uh, there's some trees in their approach that they're through the FAA, they're going to, to take down. They're in the process of getting that lined up. Uh, at this point, we don't have an, an accurate number of what that will cost, but as a 25% owner of that facility, that a portion of that will be passed on to the locality for our contribution to it. Right. When I know that number, I'll certainly share it. Very good. And they do have to do it because the FAA is going to force them to do it. No way out of it. It's going to have to be done. Uh, building and Grounds Committee. Uh, Mr. Blevins, you were acting chair. Do you want to take that one? Page 26. We we'll just get the budget committee. You, you, we had one more budget committee. But I'll be well happy if you need a break. Well, I'll just get mine and get it done. Too. Um, then we met again. The budget committee met again on March 6th. Uh, we talked about time, preparation, and approval for the budget. 4-H, uh, Smith County 4-H Extension Office had... Um, sent a request uh, to see if the county would help to fund an intern position at a cost of $2,584. Uh, the committee discussed that. Um, we uh, thought that maybe instead of monetary, if we could, if the, made a, we made a recommendation to inquire if the individual could obtain college credits uh, instead of monetary if they could get college credits toward the course. Uh, and Mr. Carter was going to follow that up with extension, and I guess you have or haven't. Or, I have not had that um, We had a, uh, the committee looked at um, an RFP for attorney services. Um, they're showed there in on page 25 of the agenda. Um, the committee recommends to uh, to send this out for RFP for attorney services, and that is a committee recommendation. And the, it's on page 25. That is a committee recommendation. If there's any more any discussion on that. Anybody? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, we then had a, tax, a real estate tax refund request in the amount of $1,593.47 for ta tax map number 421-4D. And the reason for the appeal and request to refund was because it was a miscalculation in square footage of the home. Um, so we re reviewed that. Uh, Mr. Ray made a motion. Mr. Blevins seconded it, and it passed unanimously in the budget committee. So that is also a committee recommendation. Is there any more discussion on the tax refund? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, 
Mr. A inquired about the possibility of providing some funding towards small business development, similar to kind of what the small business boot camp program is offered by the chamber. And the committee discussion is continuing on that with no recommendations. I can have a second, Mr. Chairman, on that. Sure. My, my whole thought process on this was since Lori vacated her position, we haven't hired and there's unused funds. I, I was a I was part of the small business boot camp at the, at the chambers doing and I went and I sat down and I was a judge for the business plans and I, I left there. Chill Howie has $60,000 to spend. Or well, she has $60,000 from a grant to spend with businesses in Chill Howie. But there's businesses in the county that were competing and she only has $5,000 to allocate. So I thought, well, it makes sense. We have unused funds. Uh, you know, we could allocate an additional $5,000 and help the three or four, you know, maybe out of those three or four county businesses, maybe instead of funding one, maybe we would get a second one. Um, I, I was kind of disappointed that there was no committee recommendation for that, um, especially when it's funds that are sitting there and is unused. But more troubling, um, I, the reason, the whole reason I chose to run and be here was a uh, certain certain approach that I felt my previous representative from Chill Howie had to things and that was one of a, a personal and sometimes vindictive nature and without getting into specifics I felt like the committee acted in that same manner. Um, I, I was pretty disheartened by that and uh, I, I would like to think that we could at some point readdress that and I mean if we give the five thousand dollars away you know regardless of who it goes to I think we get five thousand dollars back in sales and use tax when we when we help a business grow and develop in a very short period of time um, and it's especially when it's a unused group of funds it's just getting allocated somewhere else uh, but I, you know, there was there was two districts that that had pretty resounding turnout and in res, in relation to the, I think the sentiment that was shared in that committee meeting that day and Saltwell had high turnout and I just I just think we need to readdress it. Okay. That was all we had in the budget committee. Had building and grounds committee, Mr. Blevins, acting I, chair. I'd like a motion to, to revisit with the five thousand dollar contribution. Just back to the budget committee or to make a motion to fund it. Is it? I got a question. I'll for it, that. Is that is that uh, now that you got a motion and a second? Can we discuss it? Sure. You're talking about money left over out of Lori's funds. Our salary fund, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the unused portion that, that's in that economic development bucket to just reallocate it to, for, you know, and, it, and it, as far as our, you know, we're, we're allocating it, but it's through a competitive process, so it's not like we're singling out an entity that we want to get this. It's, you know, it removes our hands from it. It's done through a competitive process, and, and the funds are awarded, and so I think we get it back in you know, sales and use tax in a very small period of time with the development of, of the business. Mr. Chairman, I just make sure what I second here. Uh, I, you're, you're proposing to give 5000 to the chamber to increase their boot. Okay. Sure. Yes, that's what I, just in other words, we up our chamber donation by 5000 in the current year with the indication that we want to use it for the boot camp. That prior to donation that. to the Chamber of Commerce. Right. Prior to the budget request coming in for yeah, this that, coming that, year? That'd be next year's budget request. I guess the only hesitation I have on it is uh, this is coming out of our industrial development, right? And we're just bringing a new guy on. Uh, my invitation would be, you know, leave it there and see if we can 
She thinks it more clear than that. I mean, it's just my opinion. Everybody's entitled to think. I left that. I left that boot camp. There's a need. I mean, there's there's three or four competing businesses, and she's only going to be able to award one entity. Um, I would hate. I would hate for a, a very, um, in my uh, in my mind, a very sustainable and developable developable business to not have the opportunity. Yeah, the guys coming in, but I mean, there's more than, you know the numbers, I mean, there's a lot more than $5,000 sitting unused there. That's correct. And, and Probably about 30. If, if I may, the way that that boot camp money works today is the EDA provides funding for that boot camp. If, if what I'm understanding is correctly, the motion is to allow the Board of Supervisors to make a contribution of an additional $5,000 towards that program in addition to the money that's already being supplied by the EDA. Right. If, if I understood that correctly. Right. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, Mr. Ray, I'm, I'm sorry you were offended. Uh, in that discussion, I mean, we had numerous discussions. I think mean, one was should the county you know, award a grant, and there was discussion of would the grant go to the EDA and then to the chamber. There was discussion of whether it would go to the chamber, and we'd requested additional information, uh, which up to this point I haven't received any. I don't know, maybe, maybe I missed it. Uh, obviously, the, the information that you provided for when you were in the boot camp was good, and we had discussion that there were very worthy candidates, but there were other questions that needed to be answered. Uh, if if I may, sure, please. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't offended. Um, and I, I'm not this guy um, that references code and this and that. And I can't give you the exact code, but there is there is a section in the Code of Virginia that gets in and hones in on uh, using your position on an elected county government for retaliatory purposes, and I. I would, I would question some of the comments in that committee as to whether they would fall under that code or not. Uh, and again, I, I'm not here to get into specifics or, or debate it or anything. But I, I just think, I just think it was, you know, to say I'm not going to give money to this cause because I don't want X Y Z entity to get it. That's, that's unethical in my mind. I'm sorry. Just because somebody's trying to shake a stick and reposition themselves, and there's all kinds of judgment-ridden, debt-ridden farmers out there, and some are trying to recreate the wheel, and some aren't. And I just thought it was. Did we have the questions answered about were we would the donation go from the from the board of supervisors to the chamber or to economic development, and then to the chamber, or I mean, I don't, did did we get the answers to those questions? Those questions were made. It was my understanding to call to Sarah that she had, she, no one's reached out. Maybe that yeah. was my fault that I needed to. No, I, I, I haven't had time to reach out and not had to do that. May I make a comment? We, Curtis brings up a very valid and concerning point to me. Um, and this is when I ran also for office. I really do not want to see us as a board act in retaliatory um, means towards any organization. I think that they have to be funded based on their merits and not on any personal vendetta or retaliation. And I totally agree with him on that. I don't think there's anyone here that would disagree with that. No, I, I, just, I, I don't feel like yeah, we... Mr. Chairman, you were, you were there. Yeah, I don't feel like we've gotten all the information. I mean, we've got a motion and a second on the floor to either do this or not. I think if we don't know where it's going yet or, or whatever. I I think it should maybe go back to the meeting. Yeah, the, well, I mean, the motion is to award $5,000 from the Board of Supervisors <coughs> to the chamber for, okay. the, for the boot camp. All right. Well, we got a motion that's second on the floor. Mr. Chairman, I'm totally unprepared to vote on this, and, I, and you know, I'll sustain from this. I, you know, I want to look into it. There's been some... I hear accusations, I hear this, I hear that, and I don't carry a whole lot with me making a vote. Um, 
obviously for some reason there's some differences here and I, I guess we're going to vote on it but you're not going to get a vote for me tonight well there's a motion on the floor and a second uh, any more discussion all those in favor I, I'm going to abstain I'm going to abstain until we can figure out a little bit more those vote no do we need to do we need to vote no to figure out some more if we don't vote? Is two carried as majority? Mr. Cameron, you may have to weigh in on the ruling of the three in support and four in yeah. question. Uh, prototypically if you're trying to abstain from a vote, you have to state on the record the reasons for the abstention. Um, um, okay. Any okay. alternative my suggestion would be if you're if you're unsettled as to whether the propriety of doing this at this time, I would simply vote no. Yeah. Well, and and, can't and vote then you no. can revisit yeah. it at a later date once your questions are answered. I'll, I'll recant vote no for the simply reason and I want to look into the whole deal a little more. This seems and we can revisit it. I think we can revisit it. So what's the final vote? Uh, those in favor were yay, were three, and the and nays were four, I think. You might want to take that vote again. I'm not okay. sure that the Okay. All those in favor of the motion that was on the floor, raise your right hand, three, and those of no. Four. I think we just need to revisit it. Mr. Chairman, can, can that be on the agenda for Thursday? The 22nd. I mean, don't we have another budget yeah. committee meeting Thursday? Oh, uh, yeah, Thursday. We also have another board meeting this month. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just either, either or both. I'd like to keep it up. <laughs> Mr. Blavin, the Building and Grounds Committee. Mr. Chairman, uh, we have Building and Grounds Committee. The main topic was we have an HVAC contract, which was a one-year contract with, I believe, a four-year potential for rollover, five, three-year four-year rollover. Uh, we're at the time for a rollover. So a uh, discussion uh, on that contract and the motion was made. It was unanimous uh, to renew that HVAC contract for a one-year term uh, from Cook's Botanical Services, uh, which is a that had good service and no one had any issues uh, w with the service that they're providing. And that was a committee recommendation. And if Mr. Simpson needs to add anything else to that, uh, the, I just mentioned the county procured the services in 2015 for one year with four additional option years, and this is the third of the four option years. Uh, so at this time next year, the committee and the board can decide if they'd like to renew it again or, uh, or go back out for RFP at that time. Scott, what's the total for this contract? Um, it it runs in the twenty five thousand dollar range, and a lot and that's for the preventive maintenance type of work. It's for the courthouse, which you know is much larger than it used to be, and this building, and the sheriff's office, and the health department. So it covers the services for four buildings, okay. and then uh, any repairs. The sheriff's office is under a, uh, and the health department are under a. It's called a gold plan, but it's basically a bumper to bumper type of warranty service, so there's very little additional cost at those two buildings. The courthouse is fairly new, so we don't anticipate any additional major costs there. This building is old and a lot of old services and mechanically in this building, so we have some costs here that for repairs and such that it's hard to predict. It could be another three thousand, could be another ten thousand. Mm -hmm. That's all it takes. But, but it is it's it's put out for bid in accordance with the state procurement guidelines, it, right? Correct. Okay. It's procured um, as a professional service and then we went through the rankings of each individual company that that uh, uh, pre proposed. Okay. And then uh, that, this company was selected and they've been doing the work since twenty eleven. And in addition to that, we have received a letter from the company indicating their desire to continue the service. So they have also reached out to us. To but we're following the right procedure, too. Correct. Okay. It's a committee recommendation. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor? And that was all that was discussed. Or 
on the minutes for tonight. Uh, insurance committee recommendations. <laughs> yes, we had an insurance committee meeting um, on March the 6th. And the discussion in the, the previous insurance committee was we had our renewal rates from the local choice, uh, which is our insurance provider for the county. Uh, we have a 4.1% increase. We had at the previous meeting had discussed sending that to the budget committee to try to get some a feel for where we were on the budget. Uh, but based on time frames for renewal and, and notification of employees, et cetera, uh, it came back to the insurance committee. Uh, the recommendation was made to renew the plan uh, in its current state, uh, which is an 80%. I mean, you're, you're required by law to have a, or by the local choice rules, to provide 80% uh, towards an employee-only plan. Uh, currently, the county does 79% for spouse and, and family, or employee plus one and family plans. Uh, the committee made a recommendation, and it was unanimous to uh, accept that uh, going into the following year, bring that to the board um, for approval, and then those numbers would then go to the budget committee and be plugged in, you know, as far as the insurance costs to be able to meet the deadlines uh, of renewing the policy for the upcoming year. I have a, a few statements about this. Evidently, Lisa Richardson did a polling of employees. I think that had been requested to see how many uh, spouses would be eligible to get insurance through their employer. I was astounded when I did the math on what we're paying. I think that we've been gagging at a maggot and swallowing a fly because based on this, it says 42 spouses are eligible for coverage through their current employer. And 13 employees didn't respond. I really think we should have followed up and had a definite number for those 13 because it comes out to almost $400 a month if that person is eligible. So just based on what she reported of 42 spouses, that's costing the county over $200,000 a year. Now, this is not a new thing. I know probably for the last 10 years, even as a private citizen, I have asked, why can't we require that an, an employee who can get insurance to their employer do that? So I think we have been very negligent as in trustees of taxpayers' money on this. Yeah. And I hope we won't continue. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I don't know. I, 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 I see a little different shade of that. As a county um, and limited revenue sources, we, our salaries aren't exactly enticing. We're not talking about salaries. Well, bear We're with talking me. about a benefit. I, I didn't interrupt you, so give me some time here. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is when you take a benefit from an already low-paying job, we ain't going to have anybody run these things. We ain't going to have any water and sewer employees. We ain't going to have any... Uh, Convenience station. I mean, we're, we're not going to have anything left. We're already low on the totem pole. I mean, we pay an equipment operator in the low 20s. Mr. You Ray. go to Wythe County and Washington County, and you're in the, you're in the mid 30s to high four, to low 40s for an equipment operator. You know, we and I don't know the legalities of how we could back up and force somebody to go off of a family plan. But my whole thing yeah. is, we, I understand. But two hundred thousand dollars is is, is a, in all respect, I think you're missing the point, Mr. Butt. Ray. I'm saying if you're married and your spouse is married and they can get insurance through their employer. I know years ago when I worked at Brunswick, which is now General Dynamics, that's not unusual for companies to require that. So why does the county bear that burden when that spouse is not going to have any pain whatsoever? It's taking the burden off of this county, which we don't have the money. I think you're missing it. It's not taking away insurance. It's it, merely putting it, the burden where it belongs. But even though the benef even though there's insurance available to the spouse, that doesn't mean that it's that it's adequate coverage. Well, um, I think the taxpayers can decide. Let me add one little comment here. It's not in the minutes of the as I say, the minutes a lot of times leave stuff out. 
of the 42 spouses which were eligible for coverage, several of those were under, under the family plan. So therefore, if, even if the spouse went elsewhere and got coverage, the cost of the county would still be the same because we'd still have the family plan for the children. I think we narrowed it down. We really were only looking at about 13 people at the most, at the most, that would have made a difference. Out of the 54 that's identified, 28 still have plus two children. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what it comes down yeah. to. Still be on the family I still think we have a problem here. Well, I, 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 I disagree, and I, I applaud the, the, the county staff that we have and, and all the departments. I applaud the staff. I don't applaud misuse of taxpayers' money. Mr. Chairman, we, we did have that as a committee recommendation, and then I'll get to paragraph two, which I believe we've already discussed. All right. We've got that as a committee recommendation. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, the second part of the meeting was a lot of the, of the things that were just discussed. Uh, just to inform, we did get that, re that uh, update from Ms. Richardson. Uh, there was discussion. I mean, Mr. Atkins, you, you feel free to jump in. Uh, but we had requested that to just kind of see where the numbers were. Um, but like I said, uh, the committee did the first paragraph, uh, felt strongly about that. So that was the end of the, the insurance meeting. Yes, and I'd like to add to that that I, I was the one that made that request, and I know when, when, when the employees found out we were requesting that information, they went wild. But I thought we needed to know what we were looking at dollar-wise. In other words, had it been the 200000 that Ms. Wise talking about, but when we found out that, that we were really talking to just a few people, and I, I, I agree with what Curtis said here, our salary structure is such that this, this insurance is why we keep some people. Uh, if we didn't have the insurance, they'd be working at Walmart $11 an hour and making more money. Uh, so until we can work on the compensation package, we've we got to look at this as part of our compensation package and not monkey with it. And that's the way I feel. Mr. Sheriff, I may add one thing in addition. The survey that was requested was requested to be a voluntary survey. Mm -hmm. So... Of the, of the number that did not respond, we carried out what the direction of the committee's request was, is it to perform a voluntary survey. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just to weigh in on that, mm -hmm. I worked here 32 years. The reason I stayed here was benefits. I started out under five bucks a minute. Now, even though there might be a plan somewhere else for somebody, that don't mean it's a free plan. That don't mean it's as good a plan. Uh, <clears throat> on my watch for the next two years, these people over in that trash making nothing. These people in a ditch making nothing. You won't see my hand raised for it. Well, if you do the math, I don't it comes out to about $13,000 a person that the county's paying for insurance. I have a right to voice my opinion. Well, you do, but I got so, right to and I and I respect that, and I would like for mine to be respected also, Mr. Well, Stevens. I'm not disrespecting you. I am making a point. Well, I just I, and the disrespect is when you interrupt somebody when they're talking, which having respect for you is very, very hard. All right, so we got through the that's the insurance committee recommendations. Uh, solid waste, Mr. A. You want to take solid waste? Okay. Um, each of the board members should receive. Well, we met on February 27th, and Mr. Carter presented two RFPs for solid waste, both transportation and disposal services. I think all board members received those RFPs in the packet. Uh, the only thing I'll put out is uh, the disposal also has a, a, a transportation piece in there because a couple of the places that we think we'll receive bids from for the disposal contract also have um, have some transportation of their own that they may bid that as one one piece um, but if, if you all are versed with those RFPs and, and review them in your packet and don't have any other questions I entertain that we vote on those I'm putting those out for bid 
Make a recommendation. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor? Uh, personnel committee. We met on February 27th. Um, we presented an update for the director of community and economic development position that's currently open. Um, we had advertised that position again. We, the county received five applications. Uh, Mr. Carter stated that, that he and the staff had reviewed the applications, and out of the five, two candidates stood out for future considerations. Uh, Mr. Carter asked for the input of the committee and the interview process, and the committee proceeded with interviews to include staff members and personnel committees. Uh, the committee narrowed down the candidates to, there's a typo on that one, to interviewing two. Um, after the interview takes place, the committee and staff will report the summary to the full board of supervisors. And then we also met again on March the 9th. Um, we went into closed session for personnel matters to this for discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment and contracts, promotion performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, and resigning resignation of specific public offices, appointees, or employees to a public body. Uh, Mr. Call seconded that motion. We went into closed session. Um, after we concluded closed session, um, we stated again that that's exactly what we went in for. I can read this for the record if I need to. I need to. We just went in coming out of closed session. So, uh, that was the. Mr. Chairman, may I add one thing? Yes, please. To the defense of the, of the one taking the minutes. The minutes on page 28. At the time of that meeting on the 27th, the direction at that time was indeed to interview one applicant. Right. That changed after that meeting, and, and there was no record of anything further than the meeting in which we conducted the interview. So. That interviewing of one was accurate for that meeting. Just want to point that out. All right. I think that has everything on Got it all head. covered, I guess, don't we? Uh, we're down to supervisor comment time. Ms. White. Well, again, I see our crowd has dwindled, but thank you all for coming. It's always good to see you here uh, to take time to take an interest in your local government. Um, I know that we've had some differences of opinion here, and when I ran for office, I said I would stand for what I thought was right, even if I stood alone. Um, the, the question with the insurance for employees, I definitely don't want to see employees lose a benefit. At the same time, I think if... There is a way to save money without hurting anybody that we're compelled to do that. I've heard people say every dollar counts or every penny counts or, you know, we'll discuss a $3,000 difference. Well, even I'd like to know the actual numbers that would be saved because I think, once again, we're, we're just whitewashing this matter with the insurance. And I don't want employees to get the wrong feeling that, that something's trying to be taken away from them. So... I just want that to be clarified and uh, understood clearly. But again, thank you for coming. Thank you for your patience. Ms. Blevins. As always, I enjoyed the meeting. Um, Mr. Dishner, you are doing a fine job. Appreciate all of you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stevenson. I'm good. Mr. Atkins. Uh, once again, I'd like to say I think we accomplished a lot here tonight. I think we're we'll moving with our discussions. Hopefully, we'll go home friends, but no, we, we put what we felt out there on the table. And I thank the citizens for being here and sticking through to the end. The entire thank you. Have, have your hands full with us. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Ray. I did this. Mr. Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
It must be something in the water across that mountain or something. It's awful. They're absolutely tickled to death the way the library's run. All I heard two years ago was how bad it was. Now, it's how good it is. But once I cross that mountain, I mean, it's all gone again. I don't know what it is. But everything we've done the last two years has done nothing but benefit it. I've never had even a driving ticket in my life. And since I've been dealing with the library, I've been in court twice. <laughs> I'm getting pretty sick of it. My dad had a saying, the more you serve, leave it alone. Let's operate our library and be thankful that we have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, I would like to welcome that gentleman back. I've missed him. Thank you, citizens, for coming. Uh, I know sometimes we we may look like we bunch of chickens with their heads cut off, but I think uh, different views and opinions is what kind of comes around to the right <laughs> eventually. So uh, uh, appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Now we'll continue the meeting until. Thursday, the 22nd, at 7.30? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock.